Thank you so much, my friend, and thank you all my dear sisters in the Lord here and brothers. The greatest compliment any of us can receive is that when someone sees you, they see Jesus. That's when we understand that we were made in the image of God and what that really means. I want to begin with a passage. Why do you say my way is hidden from the Lord? Why do you say the justice do me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is beyond ours. He gives strength to the weary. To the one who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. This is from Isaiah 40. And every one of us have seasons in our lives, and sometimes those can be awfully long seasons when we're tired, exhausted, and all we feel is the weight of loss. There was a season in my life when the only passage of scripture I could read was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I could only read that far, but yet I knew that it ended well. And the only prayer I could pray in the morning, I would just fall on my knees and say, God, help me. And at the end of the day, all I could say is, Lord, thank you, I made it through another day. And I know that there are many of you out there who can relate to that. So that's why we talk today about from ashes to renewal. And how do we get there? What is the process of moving from exhaustion, despair, and loss? to hope, renewal, and praise. The Bible talks about renewal in specific and extremely helpful ways that save our lives. In the Old Testament, as my dear sister Michelle shared, provides us with story, with narrative, the stories of exile, the stories of loss, the stories of very, very real people who often did really terrible things and we're often the victims of tremendous horror. And it gives us the stories as examples of how to think about loss and renewal. The Old Testament provides us with historical memory to remind us that God is at work in the lives of those who went before us. And because he's at work in history, he's at work in our lives as well. The Old Testament is given to give us hope an example so that we can learn from it. <clears throat> the New Testament picks up and continues and instructs us how we can enter into that ongoing process of renewal, how we can reframe our past, our present, and give us the ability to reframe our future. And the key in the New Testament is our mind what we think, what we focus our thoughts upon, and how we frame our lives and how we see our lives in relation to God. There's often I heard quoted another passage from Isaiah, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man all that God has for those who love him. And that's from Isaiah 64 and Isaiah 66. But yet when Paul quotes that, and it's a wonderful quote, he continues in the next line in 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 10, 2, 2, verse 10 is, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. And to me, that was really insightful because I went through so much of my life looking at the losses, the things that had happened to me, just going, well, you just can't know what God's doing. And then Paul continues to quote at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and said, Who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, or that he may give him counsel? 
But then Paul goes on to say in the last verse of that chapter, but we have the mind of Christ. So there is something that happened at the cross and the resurrection for those of us who believe because God has given us his Holy Spirit. We have an ability to draw near to God, but we need to first know that, that we're not just wandering in darkness. We need to know that God provides a path and he wants to show us the way out of the pit, the way out of the darkness. Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And the Lord spoke that very familiar passage to me one day and said, Ingrid, you're supposed to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Don't set up camp there. <laughs> and that's why we can fear nothing bad, because God is with us. And sometimes all we can say is, God, help me. And that is okay, because God wants to take us from wherever we are to bring us to that place that he wants to take us. He, he is our good shepherd. He wants to restore our soul, and he can do that. So I want to start with just a little bit about my story, and then we'll look at scriptures. I'll just give you a few uh, highlights of, uh, of my life because we only have an hour. And of course, the longer you live, the more stories you have to tell, right? <laughs> and also the wonderful thing about growing older, which sometimes can be, it's like, oh my goodness, I'm getting older. But it's like, you have the opportunity to reflect. You have the opportunity to see how God took sometimes a life that looked like a big puzzle that had been dumped upside down and gone like that, and to see when we put our hand in God's hand. As the psalm says, a righteous man falls seven times but rises up again. And you know, seven's that perfect number. <laughs> Rising up again. Even though I am hurled headlong, I will not be utterly destroyed because the Lord has me by the hand. So in my life, I was the first one in my family to become a Christian. And it was a time in my life when I was 16, and I had come to the conclusion before that that the only reason anybody is ever nice to someone is to get something from them. And that really is pretty much the way of the world, but that's what I had in it concluded. And I thought, I really don't want to live in this world. So I wasn't planning on taking my life, but I was really hoping I would die young. And I remember my sister saying to me, my older sister, I said, you're going to die of old age at 25. And I just remember looking at her and thinking to myself, I sure hope so. And, uh, but the Lord met me in that when I met someone who knew Jesus, and I knew she knew Jesus. I don't even remember a conversation. I just remember looking in her eyes and seeing what I knew could only be the love of God looking at me through her. She was the image of God. She was bearing the image of Jesus Christ. And that was all it took. I went home and that whole night I just wept and wept. And God pulled a deep, deep root of bitterness out of me. I actually felt it coming out like a root out of finely tender ground. I could feel it coming out of my toes and my hands just like, and I knew when that root of bitterness was gone. And so here at 16, when I went out to see my mother the next morning, apparently my whole Appearance was so changed that she simply looked at me and said, what happened to you? Whatever it is, I want it. <laughs> so I got to share with her about Jesus. But I had no idea, so many of us who grow up in difficult circumstances, and I certainly know many people who've had far, far more difficult lives than I have, but um, we so often don't know what we don't know. And I didn't know that I should be mentored. I didn't really understand about discipleship. And there was so much I didn't know because I hadn't been raised with the Bible. I hadn't been raised with knowing what God's Word said. I, I didn't know about these things. And so I ended up making some, all for the good intentions, really bad decisions. And I ended up in a church which started out wonderful and became very oppressive. And they taught us that women can't be in ministry, and the only way a woman can be in ministry is to be married to someone in ministry. And women were to be silent in the church, and so we were to have nothing. And even an education was really a waste of time, because all you're supposed to do is get married and serve your husband and, and your kids. And so no makeup, no, you know, no jewelry, 
nothing. It was just be quiet and basically do what you're told. And so it was in that mindset that I got married to someone who was on his way to being a pastor. He actually had a third of the New Testament memorized, which is pretty impressive. He could stand up and give a three-point sermon just on the spot. He was leading uh, evangelistic crusades in the area, and I thought, oh good, I can be a minister's wife. I can serve the Lord. So we married, even though there was something in here that said, oh, don't do it. You all know how that is? We have things that we're told or things that we believe or we have our list of pros and cons. We have the things that we can figure out up here and sometimes something in here before we even know what it is says, no, don't do it. Because we have our natural mind that figures things out. In the Greek, when it's translated into English natural, it's usually the word tsuke, where we get psychology. So things that we can figure out on our own, our natural mind. But then we have the Spirit of God in us, those of us who are born again. And we can't quite tell where it is, but we know and we've heard it. So we've all had that happen, right? When it's like, all right, I've got this figured out. This is what I'm going to do. And something in here either says yes or no, but we don't listen to that. And after we go, I knew I shouldn't have done it, but I knew, but I knew. <laughs> so we, right? We have, as a believer, we have two minds. That's one of the things Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We have the mind of Christ, but we also have our own mind. And so as believers, one of the things that we need to learn in the process of renewal, in the process of avoiding jumping into quicksand, which I've been known to do, this looks good, uh, is to learn the voice of the Spirit. So again, uh, got married and he uh, was violent, which I actually found out a couple of weeks before we got married, but I didn't know how to back out and I figured, well, I'm doing what everybody thinks is the right thing to do, right? And so, for those of you who've been in abusive situations, you know, and if those of you who are, if you're in an abusive situation where it's physical, emotional, or spiritual, unless that abuser is actively getting help and usually being forced to get help, it will only get worse. But again, I was being the good, sweet wife. Don't say anything because after all, if I just work harder, if I just try harder, I can figure this out. And afterward, after all, you know, surely God will help me figure this out and he won't let this go on. But it escalated until finally some years later, he broke my nose and I finally, when I went to the hospital and they said, don't go home this time. And I still refused to report it, but I called my pastor finally and he said, go home and love your husband. So sometimes we can be in situations, you know, you always hear the pastor say, go to your pastor. Well, it's not the only time I have had many, many friends that I know who have gone to their pastor who said, but he's tithing, he's giving generously to the church, you must be lying. Or he comes forward and prays before the altar, so he must be lying, you must be lying. Or, well, I know him and his family, and you know, he's nice to everybody else, so what did you do wrong? What are you doing wrong? And so I went home to my husband, and it wasn't until he tried to kill me a few years after that and an old friend of mine came to the door I hadn't seen since before I got married, rang the doorbell, and he, he was choking me, and I had already committed my spirit to the Lord, and at that point I was like, Lord, just take me home. I had such peace. I was just really looking forward to going home to be with the Lord. I, I don't remember any pain. I just remember Lord saying, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. And I thought I was sure that was it. And then the doorbell rings, my husband gets up off of me and goes and answers the door, and there I am. I'm like, well, what do I do now? <laughs> so I kind of got up, and, and I just heard the Lord tell me a verse that he had given me when I was younger. You shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And then he also told me, and you're going to have to leave. You're going to have to escape and get out of this situation. So thank the Lord I did, and started going to, to found a wonderful Christian counselor, and that was such a blessing. So those of you who study counseling and can counsel in the Lord, God bless you. Especially, I know we've got some here who work, in, uh, work with women who are being abused. And boy, there's far too much of it in the church. Emotional, physical, spiritual. And it should not be so. Statistics are that one out of every four or five women are abused. It should not be so. So we need to learn how to get out 
get the help from someone who will actually help and trust the Lord, he will restore and renew our lives. He will, and God is so faithful. And that's why one of the biggest blessings that I hear now is when someone, when they hear some of my stories say, wow, you look like you never had a problem in your life. Glory to God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to just look more and more like Jesus, who he was oppressed, he was rejected. His own mother and brothers came to try to pull him out of place, saying in one translation, he's lost his mind. You know, not exactly a supportive family in his ministry. People tried to stone him, called him a demon, and all kinds of other things. But for the joy set before him, he endured every day, and he endured the cross. We are made in his image. So let's, we'll continue. So I uh, don't want to go too long in my story, but the Lord in his uh, mercy, I, I did uh, have to go through, to a, through a divorce and because he refused to admit, he admitted to adultery, but not to having ever laid a hand on me. And he had already put us deeply in debt. And so, and then I thought, now surely I can never be in ministry because now I'm divorced and I've got that big D written on me. And uh, so I threw myself into working as hard as I could and I did meet another man who, again, God was merciful enough to allow me to marry. And uh, he, he had been a, he was a little older than I was. He had been a Vietnam veteran. He was skilled in the martial arts and had been a mercenary before coming to Christ. So one of my priorities was I felt safe. <laughs> <laughs> and God is good. And he was very kind and loving toward me. And uh, what, one of the things that we both shared was tremendous grief. And we decided to go on this grand experiment to say, maybe God actually wants us happy. And it was a whole new thought. So we said, okay, let's get married. Let's have a child. So, you know, neither of us had ever had children. And so we had, after a few miscarriages, I had a son. And uh, we had a son. And it was just so, you know, we checked to make sure he had all his fingers and toes and you know, everything. And um, then when our son was two, my husband became ill. And that illness just progressed over nine years. And it, so it wasn't the happy home. It wasn't that uh, good ending that we had both hoped for. And four years into his sickness, it went to his pancreas, and he was in constant excruciating pain. So in and out of emergency rooms and surgeries, and our poor little boy was being dragged regularly to emergency rooms and hospitals. And, and uh, every morning for five years was just, the pain was worse in the morning. Okay, can you make it through the pain today, or do we need to take you to the emergency room? So that was pretty much every day. And, but it, yet it was during that time that the Lord started teaching me about how to be happy. Because we had thought that we were going for happiness, and we thought it meant it looked like certain things. But the Lord wanted to teach me what happiness, that no matter what we're in, we can still be renewed, we can still live a full life, even in the midst of great loss, great sorrow, and great hardship. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about that, so we're going to hold on. So after nine years of illness, my husband took his life. Our son was 11. I was just starting my second year of the Master of Divinity program at Trinity. And, um, and the Lord had definitely led me, because when I would started it, it was like, Lord, I've got so many questions. I want to understand them. And the Lord so clearly said, okay, let's learn it in the Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> so, and I was thankful because I had so many questions and I had become so cynical and you know, to listen to anybody else, what they wanted, wanted to teach about the Bible is I want to see it for myself. And I'm thankful because that became the core of how God would continue to lead me into a path of healing. In the, the Swedish tradition, and the Swedes and Norwegians, back in the late 1800s and 1900s, sent missionaries out all over the place. Most people don't know about that, but uh, but they would uh, the, the, what they would say is, "How stands it written? What does God's word have to say?" And that became the core of everything in my life as the Lord was leading me through all of the hardships that would continue to follow, because there are more things that happened. So. Financially, we lost everything. I'd been running businesses, and the person I trusted, it just kind of goes on and on. And then my son, by 13, after 
his dad dying and losing financially. My son said, I think God is mad at us and he's abandoned us. And my son just went completely reprobate. And he now says I can share anything about his life because now it's simply part of his testimony. But for five years, I had absolutely nothing to boast in. I would avoid getting together with other women who would talk about their kids and their husbands and their happy lives and new home and, you know. <laughs> and it would come to me and I got nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing. Anything that was ever any value to me, including everything that I had saved, earned, and we were very, very comfortable. I was running businesses and so forth, and everything got lost. Everything. Lost, taken, stolen, using to pay other people's I ended up nearly face, you know, having to pay out all kinds of money to, because of problems with employees and just one nightmare after another. But it was in still the midst of all that, and actually right at the end of my Master of Divinity program before starting a PhD program, and I only did it because God told me. So you know, it's like, Lord, are you sure? And he just kept providing. And I would every, sem be like, every semester, I'd say, Lord, this is a miracle. I made it through. And every semester, I'd be, Lord, unless you give me the provision, the desire, and the ability, I'm not going to go. And he would continue. It's like, OK. And once I asked, I said, Lord, can't I just go back? And I can go back and work for an insurance company and make lots of money and be really comfortable again. And I just heard God, because I'd been learning to listen to the spirit the mind of Christ in my spirit that knows things that this mind, and I just heard the Lord, he, he knows how to talk our language. And so the Lord he used his sense of humor that worked on me. Some of you may think it's, uh, I just heard said, yes, you could go get a really nice job. You could make lots of money. You could be very comfortable, or you could pick up your cross and follow me. And I'm like, oh, come on, you know? <laughs> come on, can't I do both? Come on. You know? <laughs> So, but the Lord was teaching me during that time when I had lost everything to trust in him. And I have such a wealth of stories of God's provision when I just wouldn't know time and time and time again. But that core thing that happened when I was moving forward and, and at the time when I just, I had struggling with even who I am because my identity as a mother, as a wife, as, you know, as a businesswoman, as a, even a successful student. I mean, you know, women in MDiv, not a lot of job openings, unfortunately, sadly, and that needs to change, but that's a whole other story. You know, but there, there were just not a lot of prospects in life for me. And God said, who are you? Who are you? Because I could not rest being defined by titles, by anything, even though those are all part of, God works through all of those things. But at my core, in my innermost being, if who I am in my very core is not rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, and my identity to be I am made in the image of God, and being transformed to be like the image of Jesus Christ, if my identity was not I am the daughter of the Lord God Almighty, and I am his beloved, and he looks at me as holy and beautiful and pure, because in my born-again spirit that was recreated, in my spirit is the Holy Spirit who is love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and long-suffering and self-control. The Holy Spirit who is all those things lives in me and I needed to pay more attention to who my God is in me than what, what I could see, what made sense to me, even what other people were telling me. Because we have two minds and there are two truths there's the physical realities around us, but what we often fail to realize is that it's the spiritual realities that always underlie the physical realities. We know in Ephesians 6 it says, for we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly and high places. So we have to know, we have to know that we are in a spiritual battle, but we have the mind of Christ in us we have the power and the love of the Holy Spirit. And we have God's word here and God's word that he speaks to our heart, which will never contradict his word. I want to point out that even Jesus, when he was baptized in Luke chapter 4, it says the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove and said out loud from heaven, this is my beloved son, hear him. 
that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's pretty strong. All right. <laughs> But what we miss, there's a genealogy, and then right after that, Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And what's the first thing that the devil tempted him with? If you are the son of God, right? And what did Jesus say? Didn't you just hear that voice from heaven? No, he said, for every temptation, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he referred to the word of God. If Jesus had to do that, when he was under temptation, when he was under testing and trial in the desert, in a dry place where nothing grows, without food or access to anybody, how much more do we have to know it is written? Because Satan will quote part of scripture, he's a liar and a deceiver, in the garden and to Jesus, he quoted part of scripture. You know what he told him? Brought him up in a high place, in the pinnacle of the temple and said, jump down, for the word says, I will give my angels charge over you, and they will keep you from dashing your foot against a stone. But they left out, there's a part in the middle there. I will give my angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And ways is as you're going along the path. Well, going along the path doesn't mean going up to the top of the temple and jumping off. You know, that's, so we don't test God. It's like as we're following the Lord, as we're walking in his ways, then yes, we can trust the Lord to give his angels charge over us. But it may be through the valley of the shadow of death. It may be through a dark, waste-howling wilderness, is the way uh, Deuteronomy calls the wilderness that the Israelites went through. But when we know he's with us, we have to remember, what did God say? What did God say? So it was in these times that, uh, that the Lord continued to lead me and guide me. And so I'll give uh, just a little example of how that worked, one of the ways that worked in my life. Um, my son, as I mentioned, had just gone completely AWOL. He had uh, rebelled against God. Um, I knew he still loved me, cause, but he was dropped out of high school, was doing drugs and all kinds of things, moved out of the house before he was 17. And, um, you know, a complete disaster. And so I went one morning into my bathroom and locked the door, even though there was no one home. I just seemed like the thing to do. And I just, I said, okay, Lord, you know what I'm thinking anyway. So, and you know, David does this too. It's like, I just started saying, you're a terrible father. You could be talking to my son in a way he understands. You could be doing something here. You're doing nothing. Look at my son, man, man. You know, I just railed on at God. And I said, all right, you knew what I was thinking anyway. So now I've said it. And I, <laughs> and I marched out of there and, and there was silence. But the next morning I woke up and I just heard the Holy Spirit, the Lord's talking to me and said, what does my word have to say about who I am? The word says you're a good father. The word says you're faithful. And for two weeks every morning, what does my word say about who I am? And I started just going through the attributes of God. He's a good shepherd. He's a counselor. He's a mighty God. And the government is upon his shoulders. He is my prince of peace. And peace in the Hebrew shalom doesn't just mean peace. It means... <laughs> Peace means wholeness. He is the prince, the ruler over our wholeness. God wants to make me whole. He wants to make my son whole. So after two weeks of that, then the Lord woke me up one morning and said, I want you to believe in your son. And my response was actually this, are you kidding me? There's nothing to believe in. You know, you've got to be kidding me. So that was my response. And it was realistic because based on what I could see, even his friends were coming, you know, I mentioned I had lost everything. His friends would still come in the house and rob things out of my house. And I had so little left. I mean, it was just, you know, and the kids who didn't like my son came and scraped up my car. And, you know, I was just, and I had lost everything. So that was my response. But the next morning, the Lord said, what does my word say? And I remember the first word I remembered, because I'd been in the word. You've got to be in the word, my sisters. Brothers, you've got to be in the Word of God. You've got to be reading it. I remembered I had read in Isaiah 54. All my children will be taught of the Lord, and great will be the shalom of my children. It actually says your children will be. But, that's, but I personalize it. You've got to personalize the Word of God. And so for two weeks again, every morning, what does my Word have to say? Because my son had known the Lord when he was growing up. He had demanded to be baptized against all, when he was seven years old. I mean, he was just not going to back down. He was one of those kind of kids. Some of you have had <laughs> friends and kids like that, you know. When you see strong-willed, you see a picture of your child, you know, <laughs> definition. Yeah. That was my son. 
And, uh, and so I remembered, and then I, I, so I knew the word of God had been planted in his heart. I knew that he had known how to pray. And so I remembered then what it says in Isaiah about, so shall my word be, it will not return to me void. And I remembered, and I, so all these passages in the word of God about God's word being seed, in the parable about the seed and the sower, in, uh, where is it, Luke 8, Mark 4, talks about my word is seed. And I knew God's word, his seed, had been planted in my son's heart. And I knew God's word would not return void. So I started having faith in the power of the seed, faith in the power of God's word, which I knew had been planted in his heart and in his mind. And so after two weeks, I went from having, for a long time, being sleepless almost every night, wondering if my son could be killed, not knowing if I'd ever hear from him again. And I entered into such a place of peace. It was like, God's word is true. God is a good father. God is faithful. God's word is true. His word is more true than what I can see. So what I see is, are you kidding me? But what God sees is, that's his son. And he is speaking to my son in a way he can understand. And God is at work in his life. And God's word is going to grow and bear fruit. Because even when seeds grow, you know, the roots go down first before you see anything come up. So you plant a seed, and what do you see at first? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, but you got to trust that the seeds at work, give it some water, give it some nourishment, and it will grow. That's the way God's word is. And I saw how I was getting in the way. I was doing all the mother guilt stuff. Oh, you're breaking your mother's heart. Don't you know what you're doing to me? You know, all those things that we do, you know. And the Lord said, quit manipulating him. That will not bring forth my word. You know, that's like digging up the seed and saying, why aren't you growing? You know, <laughs> and that's what I kept doing. And the Lord said, trust me, give me space to work. And how do I do it? By faith. By faith, not in the circumstances, by faith in God's word, by faith in what he has to say. And, the, the, and I allowed God's word to take root in my heart. And then after two weeks, my son came home one day, and he was in the kitchen, of course, came home for food. He was at the sink, so his back, my, his back was to me, and he asked me, Mom, do you believe in me? I was so glad he wasn't looking at my face because my face went, oh, thank you, God. <laughs> but I was able to say with complete honesty, yes, I do. And I know that everything that we've been through and everything that you've been through, God is going to turn this around. I know God is at work in your life and you're going to see every loss, every horror, every fear, and every nightmare, and everything that seems like a complete waste, you're going to see God turn that around in your life. You are going to have a good life. And he turned around and he looked at me and for five years after his dad died, he didn't cry. He just tried to be as hard and cold as he could. And his eyes welled up. It was the first time I'd really seen emotion in his eyes in five years. And he said, thank you, Mom. Because if you don't believe in me, how can I believe in myself? You know me better than anyone. And isn't that like our Father? Our Father believes in every one of you. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what's been planted in your hearts. And all he's asking you to do is just open your heart to him. Remember his word. Part of renewal is remembrance. Remember the things that God has done in your life. Not just all the bad stuff. Remember where you've seen God at work. Remember the words that he's spoken to you. Remember the dreams he's given you. Remember the hopes that he's had. Hope. Hope comes before faith often. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. So if you say, I just don't have faith for that, start with hope. Let hope well up. Faith becomes the substance of what you hope for. So start with wherever you are. Let God take you from where you are, and he will bring you where he wants you to be. And what he has for you, it is truly better than what we can see. It truly is, because our minds have become so clouded by what we can see and what makes sense to us and what seems possible to us. God wants to take his word and make it so alive in you. Let his word dwell in you richly. Listen to his word. And that, in my son's life, started to open the door. Started to open the door. And now, five years later, my son, he ended up coming back home, getting a job. Took him about a year for his brain to heal because 
your brain actually sort of gets holes in it when you're doing all those crazy things. And so he could actually feel a time when his brain is like, ah, part of my brain must have just, because I, I showed him MRIs or CT scans of what brains look like that have been on drugs. And so, he, so he got a visual of it too and said, God will heal that because your brains can heal. It's amazing things. Our DNA can change. Yes. These are things that are proven now. We don't have to be who we were. Even our DNA and our very brains, our body is so incredibly resilient, and especially when we put ourselves into God's hands. God will change us. But it starts, the spiritual always comes before the physical. So just believing God with whatever little mustard seed we've got. Say, Lord, this is how far I can trust right now. God says, good enough. Let's go with that. All right, let's see that grow. Wherever we are, God will take you from where you are and bring you to where he wants to take you, as far as you'll let him, as deep and as beautiful as you'll let him. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Age, it, it, nothing matters. We'll talk about some more stories in a bit, as long as I don't run out of time, because you know I could go for days. <laughs> you got the clock. Yep, you'll give me the warning. <laughs> so yeah, amen. And so my son ended up getting his GED and starting at the community college, did really well, went on to college. He graduated just last May, honors in his program. Along the way, he met this wonderful, wonderful Christian woman, and uh, I introduced them. <laughs> I did a little bit of manipulation there. All right. <laughs> Spirit led, yeah. I met this girl, I said, boy, that's someone I'd like my son to marry. And, wow. And he ended up thinking so too, you know, but uh, <laughs> so they've been married in May. It'll be two years. He's applying now to grad school. He wants to get a PhD in English literature. And during his college years, he was in campus ministry and he'd meet someone whose life was messed up. And he, you know, he would just, because just like God talks our language, you know, he, dude, that's really dumb. It's not going <laughs> to, it's not going to get you where you want to go. And he was believable because if they'd say, that, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> he had so many, he had been through so much himself. So the joy, the joy in our lives is seeing all of those areas of brokenness, those areas of the deepest hurts, deepest fears, deepest failure, deepest shame, deepest guilt. Those are the very things that God wants to turn in to your greatest joy, your greatest victory the most beautiful thing and your greatest strength in your life. Let me, this is how my life felt. And in uh, the Bible, you've heard of Job, for example, ashes on his head after great losses. So what is ashes? What are ashes? Ashes are when everything has been burnt up, there's nothing left. And so Job, when he lost everything, ashes put ashes on his head. They would do that sometimes when they were mourning. They would put ashes on their head. The passage that Jesus quoted when he began his ministry was from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring deliverance to the captives. And he goes on, but he doesn't quote all of it, but I'm going to bring you to Isaiah 61, verse 3, because surely Jesus knew that this came. It starts out, to comfort all who mourn in Zion, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, and it says to give them beauty for ashes. And I'm going to stop right there. In the Hebrew, and the Hebrew plays with words, the word for ashes is, I'll just use the English, uh, is close enough, A-P-R, and then the word for beauty is P-A-R, so it takes the same substance, same three letters, turns them around. Isaiah does that all the time, and Hebrew especially does that. It gives you a little word picture to give you a spiritual understanding. God wants to take the very substance of your ashes, uh, and he wants to turn them oh, is it moving forward into, and the word for beauty, different translations, one of them is a beautiful headdress, a garland, a thing of beauty upon your head, so that very ashes the very thing where it seemed like there's nothing left that you felt like that covered your head. That's when we put it in God's hands, it turns it into a thing of beauty on your head. It becomes that thing of royalty, a thing that you now hold up proud in your head. The very ashes, and it goes on. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. 
the garment of praise instead of a fainting spirit, that they might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And that word that he might be glorified, same three letters in it. So right there, that's the message. We have a redeemer who wants to take the ashes of our lives, turn them around, make them something that we will bear proudly in our head. That's how God becomes glorified in our lives. We trust him because he is a redeemer. God can take the worst anything and when we'll just continue to hold on, just hold on, he will give us joy, praise. We'll become oaks. You know, these are the trees with really deep roots of righteousness, strong, where others can rely on, and God becomes glorified. Now, the uh, passage in the New Testament that I so love and resonate, Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is we have on the front of your booklets here. And this tells us the process of renewal. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his perfect, pleasing, and perfect will. So again, when we think of offering our body as a living sacrifice, you know, this was a cute little picture that I found. So there's, in the Old Testament, there was lots of dead sacrifice because it's a whole burnt offering. So, because that was a picture. In the Old Testament, it was a picture of what God wants us to be. He wants us to offer ourselves wholly, completely to him, to consider ourselves dead to our old way of thinking, <laughs> that are you kidding me kind of thing, you know, in different circumstances. Lord, how are you going to fix this? It's too hard. You can't do it. You know, all of those ways of thinking. We have to consider ourselves dead to those ways of thinking and say, no, I have a redeemer and I have no idea, Lord, how you're going to fix this, but daddy, Abba, father, you know, Abba, daddy. We go, because of Jesus, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have the mind of Christ within us, and he will walk us through. He is the good shepherd. He calls himself, I am the good shepherd. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came and I am here to give you life and give it abundantly. So when we're not experiencing that, we say, it may look like this, my situation may look, and then we can list all the ways it looks, but then we have to say, okay, that's just my natural mind thinking, Lord, what does your word have to say? What does your word have to say? We gotta dig in the word, dig in the word, so that we can know, Lord, I want to understand how you see things. I want to understand, what you see in this situation. I want to even see myself and even that person that may have wronged me, I give them to you. Forgiveness doesn't mean you have to go make friends with every abuser or everybody who was mean to you, but you can let them go, give them to God, trust God with them so that they don't rent space in your mind because our hurts and our fears, all these things, they will rent space in our mind that'll just be far too exhausting. We cannot, we cannot stay there. We have to lay aside, take those old things, put them on, put them on the, the altar. And living sacrifice because we can crawl off the altar, right? So a hundred times a day, okay, Lord, <laughs> here I am again. I'm going to give you my way of thinking about this. Oh, do you think that guy cut me off in traffic? Hey, it's, all right, Lord, I don't know what his day is like, but I'm going to give that person to you. Or, oh, but my boss is, ah, you know, or, ah, you know, whatever. I've got a really nice boss, so it won't. But, uh, I haven't always. <laughs> I had a boss once who would actually try to make people cry. She would bring people in her office, and that was her goal, to make people cry, actually. So, but I had to even learn there. Yeah, it wasn't here at Trinity, so no. <laughs> this was long ago, but uh, yeah. I've had all wonderful bosses here at Trinity. But, but again, you know, we have these situations, people that will just specifically, and it can be a family, you know, it can be, we just give them to the Lord, and we say, Lord, 
I'm not going to look at this situation or this person because we're not wrestling flesh and blood. We're wrestling against powers and principalities. The thief who wants to steal, kill, and destroy is the spiritual realities are behind the physical realities. So we've got to lift our eyes, listen to the Spirit of God in us who has always loved joy, peace, who always demonstrates the wisdom from above, which is pure and peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated, without hypocrisy, always produces the fruit of righteousness. We have the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ dwelling within us. So we've got to sometimes tell this mind, go, eh, quiet, quiet. I sometimes speak to myself like it's a toddler. It's like, that's enough now. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, but I want to get mad, and I have every right to get mad, or, but I want to cry, and I just, it's like, well, there are times that we have to, you know, there's a right getting mad, and, you know, it's okay, you know, you know, we're, we're, but we have to realize, okay, honey, you know, so you have to do yourself, okay, honey, you know, just like you would a little tough, okay, honey, it's going to be all right, listen to Jesus now, come on, <laughs> settle down, you know, even David in the last chapter of 1 Samuel, yeah, I mean, the, Ziklag, the name of the town where he and his men were all with their families and it had, they had gone off to battle and the enemies had come in and burned the town and taken their wives and children. And, and the first thing they all did was cry, these mighty men of warrior, mighty warriors. The first thing they did was cry. So that's okay. You know, I mean, sometimes we just need a good cry. And then they threatened to stone him. That wasn't too good, because <laughs> then, you know, like most people, it's your fault. You know, we're always looking, it's your fault. So we got to, you know, be aware people will do it to us. We do it to other people. It's got to be somebody's fault. You know, who can I get mad at? Or, you know, who can I blame? Yeah. And then he strengthened himself in the Lord. He turned to, even though he didn't have the Holy Spirit within him, we do. We've got the Holy Spirit in us. So we can, we strengthen ourselves in the word. We remember, what did God say? What is God's... What has God promised about this? What is, what is God's will for me? He wants me to be whole and strong. How does, so we, we turn from this mind. James says, when you lack wisdom, ask, because God gives liberally. He never holds back. But don't be double-minded, because we all have two minds. So it's like, ah, we have this wisdom, which may say, well, I have every right to be angry, and, you know, or I've, you know well, I, you know. But then we go, wait. But the wisdom from above, God's wisdom, who dwells in me through his Holy Spirit, is pure and peaceable and gentle, easy to be entreated. It's without hypocrisy, and it's going to produce fruits of righteousness, not fruits of strife or contention, not fruits of tearing apart or, you know, all these different ways. Peace, a peaceable fruit. And again, peace isn't just, everybody be quiet. Peace is wholeness. God wants to take our situation. A peacemaker isn't just someone who says, oh, quit fighting, everybody get along. That's not, a peacemaker is someone who comes in and says, I want to see everybody made whole. How can this situation be whole? How can I be made whole? How can you be made whole? What can we do to see God's kingdom come and his will be done here in this situation where we are seated and talking today as it is in heaven, which means there's an option to not do that. If Jesus prayed that, how much more are we? If Jesus went to the word of God to fight off the temptations, how much more are we? Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, Lord God. Show me, because I know I've got your spirit in me. We've got to learn. In our, quit saying, I'm too busy, I'm too stressed. Quit saying those things. You're empowering that in your life. Say, Lord, you have given me all the time I need today to accomplish what you have called me to do. So if I'm exhausted, it means I've taken on something you have not given me. And that also means I'm taking it away from someone else who should be doing it. That helps set you free a little bit, right? <laughs> so, because most women I know, especially, uh, we're always looking to work harder. You know, we always, oh, well, I should do this, and they need that. And Jesus was not driven by people's needs. Because if he was driven by people's needs, he would have been just going all the time, healing everybody. He was... He was driven by faith. People would come to him and say, what do you want? Even though he would always know. But however they came to him was the way where he would meet them. So if they'd say, Lord, come, come to my house, pray for my daughter. He'd say, all right. He'd go and pray. If they'd say, Lord, speak the word only and my servant will be healed. He goes, be it unto you as you believe. 
and his servant was healed. Come crawling to him on your hands and knees, hoping nobody will see you, just to touch the hem of his garment, hoping nobody will see you because you're so ashamed and so afraid and people have cast you out. Jesus will turn around and say, I see you, daughter. I see you. Your faith has made you whole. Go. Go in peace. God will meet us where we're at. We can hear his voice wherever we're at in the brokenness because every one of us if there's any of you who've never experienced deep pain, you will at some point in life. And some of you have lived in pain for most of your life. We all have these seasons, but wherever we are, wherever we are, we go to Jesus as we are and say, Lord, because I'm your child, because I am born again, it means your Holy Spirit lives in me. And since your spirit is in me, I can know your mind. I can know and understand your spirit in my spirit. And it may, and it will, conflict with this. This has to come into submission to this, to the spirit of God. This has to come into submission and learn to see. These eyes need to learn to see the way God sees instead of what makes sense to our eyes. We can see, we can see differently. We can see the things of the Lord. And he wants us to set our mind on things above, not on things in the earth. I have so much more material. I only got through the first like eighth of my slides. <laughs> but, uh, but we are out of time. And I, you know, I trusted the Lord. Even when I prepared them, I, I sensed the Lord was saying, you're probably not going to use those. So I was like, all right. But these are, these are a couple of really key verses. And in, in this that your notebooks, I provided several verses that you can take home and meditate on. Because that setting your mind on things above, that's in Colossians chapter 3. Let me close with this. Therefore, and whenever there's a therefore, I always have to stop and say what it's there for. Yeah, you know that one. So, uh, and so we'll start with a therefore. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, If you have died with Christ to the elemental elementary spirits of this world, why, as if living in the world, do you submit yourself to all of these things? Do not be conformed to this world. Do not submit yourself to, well, that's what everybody else is doing, and well, that's what they told me to do, and well, this looks reasonable to me, and well, this makes sense to me, and well, this is what I, I was always taught that I should say, and, oh, I can't change because I'm like this. Well, I'm always an angry person. I'm always a crier. I'm always a, do not be conformed to even your old self, but be transformed. It's in chapter 3, verse uh, 1. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, so we die, to, we die with Christ to our own ways of thinking, ways of thinking, ways of doing. And sin doesn't just mean gross sin. Sin is simply not going God's way. The word repent in the Hebrew simply means turn. <laughs> so... Uh, so as a well-meaning Christian for much of my life, I'm a Christian, I'm doing what I should, I'm living a good life, I'm not a sinner, I, I keep God's word. But I wasn't listening to him at all, so I really had no idea what God was saying, and I wasn't, I would kind of read the word, but I wasn't allowing myself to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. So even as a follower of Christ, I wasn't really following, I was following what made sense to me. So back to this verse. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father, and set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on this earth. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. And then it, that passage just continues. It's a good passage because then it compares worldly ways of thinking, which is, well, what would be good for me in my career? What would be good for, oh, this, my son needs to do this, or my daughter needs to do this, because that would be good for, wait, wait, Lord, what do you have? Am I just doing what makes sense to me, or what all my neighbors are doing? Well, they're all in ballet or soccer or whatever, you know. I slow down and listen. Spend time in the Word and say, when you read the Word, it's about getting to know the Lord. We want to know how he's thinking. It's, you know, when you've had a friend for your whole life or you know, those of you who've been fortunate enough to have a, a spouse that you've had your whole life or a sister or brother, just someone that you've known for at least long enough that you know what they're thinking, you know what they like, you know what they like to do and don't. That's the way we want to be with God. We want to spend so much time with him that 
we start to know what he likes so we can feel his pleasure. We can feel his delight. And we keep praying and pressing in because if that feels really distant, I remember when I first started on the journey, I said, Lord, I want to know what it means to walk in the Spirit. I know, want to know what it means that you love me because right now it's only a theological construct to me. It's only because the Bible tells me so, but I would pray that prayer in Ephesians that I would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that I'd be filled with all the fullness of God. So I would know the length and depth and height and width of the love of God. And I keep, that's going to be, I'm going to be learning that the rest of my life. God wants us to know that he loves us. He wants us to know him. And we can grow in that knowledge. But we have to quiet ourselves, take time in the word, Take time to listen and identify between, as Hebrew says, the word of God is sharp and powerful and sh sharper than any two-edged sword. It separates between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. So the word of God, so you say, okay, Lord, I don't know what to do. I know it. Here's some verses about what wisdom is, and I know what I'm you know, getting. A, so we, get, we learn to know God's voice and his wisdom within us, and we continue to grow as we listen to him and find those who we can share those things with as well, because we're never to be in isolation. Never to be in isolation. But we seek those who will help build us up in the spirit, help build us up in the word, help draw us closer, because we know the difference. We all do. So if you're in a situation and, and inwardly it's going, get out, or inwardly it's going, yes, there's life there. Follow life. Follow life. In Deuteronomy it says, choose life. Don't choose death. And we know the difference when we listen. Choose life so that you and your family may live. And then it goes on to say in Deuteronomy 30, for I am your life. He is our life. So we choose, but he helps us. We choose joy, we choose life. And we learn to discern. So that is a little, a little bit about renewal because in that process, in that process of following after him, pressing in after him, getting to know him, spending time with him, we'll find peace enters in, even in the midst before we see any changes. God's peace will start to enter in. We start to know his love. We start to know him. And we continue to grow and grow and grow. The rest of our lives should be that. Pressing in, it's like, Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know. I want to go deeper. Right now, I feel like I remember when I first put my toes in the water, even as a Christian for 20, over 20 years. It's like now I feel like I'm maybe ankle deep. I want to swim in it. Someone gave me the best picture of abiding in Him, you know, that says, if you abide in Him and He abides in you. And I'm thinking, how do you? He said, okay, picture the ocean and you're a cup because we are earthen vessels. So you take a cup and dip it in the ocean. The ocean's in the cup, the cup's in the ocean. You know, God is an ocean of love and wisdom. So we just immerse ourselves in him, and then he fills us at the same time. It's kind of cool. I like that. That one has helped me. So just continue. Immerse yourself in God and be around those who will encourage you. Let's pray.